So when I was uh, invited to be part of this uh, this conversation today, I, I accepted gladly, but only on the condition that uh, Itai would allow me to present uh, based on a paper that's already been published, uh, one that is titled India's New Cold Geography. It came out, um, I think, last year in Energy Research and Social Science, written along with uh, Patrick and Kuntala and Brototti, who are also uh, who make up the rest of the panel today. So, And the reason why I had to insist on presenting this paper is that it is in fact the only thing I've written so far on, on coal. And my contribution to the joint paper on India's coal geography came not from my knowledge about coal in India as such, but more from having worked in a state uh, in Western India, namely Goa, where, where coal suddenly became uh, a major issue and particularly the, the prospects of the state becoming a new hub for imported coal. Um, but since then, I've, I've had the, the opportunity to join a, another research project located here in, in Norway that is looking at uh, India's ambitions and possibilities of becoming a global green leader. So this may allow me to, to actually go back and do something on coal in the future. Um, but in any case, there is uh, perhaps a, a double risk in this uh, in this presentation. Uh, on the one hand, it may be familiar to some of you already what I'm going to say if you've read the paper. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, some of the contents may be a little outdated since I have not continued working on uh, on these things uh, since the paper came out. So I'm here very much dependent on um, Patrick and, and Kuntala and Brototti to be willing to, to jump in later during the, the Q&A if there are particular questions to, to this presentation. Um, so, so here goes. Among the main countries in the world that consume coal, we know now that India is and remains a key player. Uh, domestic coal extraction and use is still expanding, and the country is emerging as a key agent in the global coal trade as, as one of the world's biggest importers of coal. India has for long imported higher purity so-called coking coal for steel making, primarily from Australia. But the import of thermal coal for power production is uh, much more recent. Uh, before 2002, that's uh, up until 20 years ago, uh, thermal coal did not even exist as a category in official statistics. But since then, imports have risen dramatically. Um, in 2007-2008, India imported 10 million tons of thermal coal that rose to 45 million tons uh, just a few years later. Uh, recent figures from 2018 to 2019 shows imports of 150 million tons, the following year 196 million tons, and the last fiscal down just a tiny bit to around 165 million tons. But if we use 2007, 2008 as a baseline, this amounts in any case to an increase in recorded imports of well over 1000% in a decade and a half. So it is in response to India's dramatically increasing coal imports that we analyze the production of what we term India's new coal geography. An entirely new geography of thermal power infrastructure within the country based on international supplies of coal that had until recently uh, not been mapped and analyzed systematically. As uh, Kuntala alluded to in her presentation, this new coal geography is largely coastal and controlled by private actors who operate ports and power plants that rely on imported coal. And it runs parallel to and yet is distinct from the domestic public sector mining and power generation of what we then called India's old coal geography. So in order to do this mapping analysis and analysis of the new coal geography, we ask in the paper uh, the following questions. What are the political, economic and technical infrastructural realignments that have enabled coal-based power generation in this new coal geography? How is this geography configured at the national level? And how do subnational regions change infrastructurally, politically, and environmentally when they are integrated into this new coal geography? By addressing these questions that incorporate both the making of a new coal geography at the national level, and also its localized manifestations and impact in specific states and contexts, we argue that India's rise as a global player in coal trade coupled with the emergence of a new coal geography at home, represents in fact an energy transitions towards more coal-based energy. 
This energy transition, we think, will add to India's already significant reliance on coal energy for some time to come, of course, with significant negative consequences for global climate change. So while the full paper offers both the big picture as well as a more localized case study from Goa, uh, for reasons of time, I cannot really give you both uh, here. So I'll uh, focus mainly on, on the big picture of India's new coal geography. Just a little bit of theory to, to inform the work that we do in the paper. So we draw inspiration from work on resource geographies within human geography and specifically assemblage thinking, which enables us to see the interlinking of different networks of humans and materials. Putting in place a complex resource geography like coal energy is, in this perspective, always a process of making, of continuous transformation and of becoming rather than as something final or static or fixed. Resource geographies rely on a set of interlinked logics of economy, territory and subject formation that bring together a rich energy scape of new relations as different sites become connected in the production, but also transport and generation and transmission of energy. Such relations not only shape energy and so so environmental outcomes, they also crucially produce economies and forms of politics whose impact may span generations. And that's an important point. New resource geographies, in our case, India's new coal geography, thus emerge as one special aspect of a global assemblage of finance, infrastructure, and expertise that together constitutes the political economy of coal. So in that sense, we do not see energy production as singular and fully functional systems with a controlled and centralized design. Actually, far from it, as the case of India's new coal geography will also show. Now, historically, the backbone of Indian energy security was always what Kuntala Lahiridut has called statecraft coal. Domestically produced coal that relied on a set of interlinked public sector enterprises. So in this old coal geography, state-owned Coal India would extract coal in the central and eastern parts of the country, then transport it by the Indian railways by heavy-duty links to the main cities of the north, west and south, with the National Thermal Power Corporation, or one of the many state electricity boards around the country, as the final consumers or final customers. In contrast, the precondition for India's new coal geography lie in the liberalization of the economy from the 1980s onwards, which slowly opened the coal energy sector to private actors. An early key reform in the sector happened in the year 2000, when the private sector was allowed to mine for own industrial production purposes in, for example, cement and steel making units. units. And since 20, 2018, the entire sector has been opened up for private companies, including international ones. Other significant policy reforms that also paved the way for this new coal geography include the possibility to import coal and power generation technologies required to expand energy production. We also find at the same time extensive policy experimentation in the domain of energy from around 1995. This process of policy experimentation would unfold over many decades and involves frequent adjustments between various branches of the government of India, led by its Ministry of Power. The focus was initially on domestic coal-based power expansion as well as hydro, but widened over the years to include private sector thermal power from 2006. Key to the development of India's new coal geography was the ultra mega power production policy from 2005 in support of large power plants of at least 4000 megawatt using high efficiency supercritical technology. Nine projects were originally proposed with four located next to coal mines and five in coastal locations. While most coal projects proposed since the early 2000s were based on the use of domestic coals, these ultra mega power projects encourage the use of imported coal of higher quality than what is available in India. And over the years, more proposals were made. 15 received approval with approximately half of these intending to use imported coal. 
But to date, only two of these UMPPs have become operational, the coastal Mundra power plant in Gujarat and the Sasan power plant next to a coal mine in the central Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. In spite of its limited appeal, the UMPP policy did manage to open up a new approach to producing power in coastal locations, something that had not been attempted before. One key Ministry of Coal planning document noted already in the early years of coastal power development that, and I quote, importing power grade coal for consumption in power plants at certain coastal locations is considered necessary for enhancing fuel diversification and energy security, unquote. But the import of oil and natural gas already weighs heavily on India's balance of trade. And branches of the government of India have therefore not looked favorably at adding coal to the list of imported fuels. Successive high level ministers have continued to reiterate their intention to end all import of coal. A few years back, for example, the Minister of Coal stated that all coal import would end in the fiscal year 2023 2024. But this has not happened and this will not happen. Indeed, lower domestic supplies of coal this spring has just led the Ministry of Power to call for higher imports of coal to meet the shortage of domestic supplies, even though the price of seaborne coal is now approaching record levels. So coal thermal so, sorry. so thermal coal imports into India in March and May this year were in fact the highest since 2019. Indonesia is the world's largest exporter of thermal coal and has also been the main source for India's coastal power plants so far. One source places the country's share at more than 60% in 2018. The Adani Group, which owns a number of thermal power plants in India, also handles about a third of all Indian coal imports via its ports. The company operates five ports around India with the flexibility to switch to domestic coal if this becomes preferable to international coal. In a newspaper interview, uh, one Adani executive stated that, and I quote, that's the advantage we have having ports on both sides of the peninsula, you can catch coal, for instance, at Damra and ship it to Goa, Vishakapatnam, Mundra or Dahej, unquote. The power plants of India's new coal geography will depend on shipments of coal for decades to come. And an operator such as the Adani Group is well positioned to ensure a flexible supply of it via its ports from several different international as well as domestic sources. So flexibility in coal supply and also port infrastructure are in this manner two additional key enablers of the new coal geography. Data shows that 77 coastal power plants with widely variable power generation sizes were approved from 2005 to 2014, mainly by private sector proponents, but also by public sector ones. The projects were environmentally approved, which means that specific sites had been identified and that detailed environmental impact assessment reports had been finalized and extensively vetted in both public hearings and by environmental experts. In contrast, after 2014, only seven projects had been approved. Had all 84 environmentally approved coastal power plants been operational, that would have added significantly to India's currently 294 operational thermal power plants. But as of early 2020, only 27 of these 84 per power plants were operational. Some of the new energy producers are among India's largest business groups, including Adani, Reliance and Tata. The Adani Group has, in addition to building ports, been active in thermal power by building its own coastal power plants and buying already existing ones. At the same time, the company has invested in a new power plant away from the coast running on domestic coal. We find thermal power clusters across a few states in Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. These are industrialized or higher income states with high energy demand. Within the states with coastal power, much of the power plants form coal clusters in the immediate vicinity of a coal port. A few larger companies have also been able to build dedicated ports to import coal to meet their own needs. 
So moving the coal a short distance over land from ports to power plants appears the preferred choice for operators rather than locating the power plant on cheaper land further away from the port. So to quickly summarize, India's new coal geography consists of coastal power plants spread across the country and driven by many different investors, from well-known Indian business groups to state power producers and also some relatively unknown private entities. The fact that these pl plants tend to have great operational flexibility indicates the considerable political support they enjoy. While public authorities could have strictly enforced approval conditions pertaining to plant size, fuel use, or environmental regulations, they have in practice preferred that power plants are established and by and large become operational. So this new coal geography is, we suggest, the outcome of a prolonged period of gradual and distributed experimentation and flexible adjust adjustment by many different actors in both the private and the public sector. And you can find more de details about this prolonged period of experimentation in the paper itself. But more problematically, the well-entrenched and expanding infrastructure and policy support which underpins the new coal geography at a moment in history where climate change is evident and India's domestic renewable energy sector is fast expanding, raises some complicated and uncomfortable questions about the country's future energy transition. Is India's coal geography new as well as old, sufficiently robust to fend off the twin challenge of climate change and cheap renewables in the short to medium term? Based on the analysis in this paper, the answer would seem to be a tentative yes. Rather than a transition away from coal, the main energy policy question in India today probably concerns the relative share of domestic to imported coal within the dominant coal-based energy system. Thank you.